It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. So you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Entertainment. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. So you might be wondering. How do you get to ask questions? All you have to do is use the question panel on the right of GoToWebinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter to submit your questions with the hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons with your hosts, Will Curran of Endless Entertainment, Laura Lopez of Social Tables, and Sean Holiday of Crowd Mics. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody. It's Will Curran. Excited to be here. Unfortunately, Laura's in New York City planning an epic event for Social Tables, and Sean Holiday couldn't make it because he has a ton of meetings growing that crowd mics like crazy. So uh, it is just me and our guest today. It is a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, which is a little uh, different than usual, which I'm really excited for because it means we get to dive deep into this uh, amazing man that I have with us today. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm going to jump right on in. Uh, this week's guest is Mr. Michael Mazzacco. Michael is an amazing friend. Uh, he actually invited me to be on the ILEA board, and that's how we officially met. But I've been a big fan of his food and uh, the Herb Box's food for a very long time. Uh, if you've never been to Arizona, there's a really awesome restaurant called the Herb Box, and they opened up a catering arm, which Michael runs, and literally makes the best food you have ever eaten in your entire life. Um, and so we knew we wanted to do a topic on catering, which as it being a huge line item on your budget, we knew we had to have some discussion around it. So uh, super duper exciting. I'm also really personally fascinated about this one too because I don't know a lot about catering. I li like literally when I, I hire Michael for events, I say, Michael, here's my budget, make it good. And then I trust him so much. So, so he, he loves that. But obviously, you know, we got to be smart planners out there and we got to make sure that we have the best catering possible. So we're going to dive a little bit from beginner stuff to the advanced stuff, learn about trends. Um, but I'm just really, really excited because Michael's got an amazing story. He's an amazing caterer. Uh, and I'm just so excited to have it. So everyone, please welcome Mr. Michael Mazzago. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Michael. Um, so we're going to kick off the first question that uh, everyone knows and everyone's prepared for. I want to know, so, and because I know how interesting this story is too, what got you into the events industry? So that is quite a long story, and I'm going to try to uh, get into a shorter version. But I was working in restaurant and hospitality for over 30 years. I worked all over the country. Um, my first big gig in what I would call bistro service, not exactly fine dining, but uh, for, was for a restaurant called Sausalitos in Cleveland with Gary Lucarelli. Um, this man was the restaurateur of Cleveland, um, really interesting man, um, and hosted that room like no one's business. Um, he knew everyone in that room and would walk around and talk to people, and it, it intrigued me. I just really enjoyed um, uh, restaurants and working for this man, and so I continued um, uh, down that path. Uh, I actually got a degree in uh, dance, modern dance, many pounds ago, and um, so while I wasn't uh, performing and studying there, I was waiting tables and kind of moved my way up. Um, fast forward to uh, 1999, um, I moved to New York City um, with um, very little money in my pocket, to be quite honest, um, and a contact for a possible job. Um, uh, I ended up getting um, a job at a phenomenal restaurant, um, La Madre, owned by Pino Luongo. Um, you'll read about him in Kitchen Confidential, actually, and there's a whole article, a whole chapter about him, but um, I had absolutely no right um, working for this man or for this restaurant. Um, it was so beyond my knowledge, but um, I've heard uh, a term that I love now, fake it till you make it, and it's exactly what I did. <laughs> I really um, uh, tried to learn all I could and, and take it all in. Um, while I was there, I had the wonderful opportunity of uh, 
doing the bars for the VH1 Fashion Awards post party for Anna Wintour. Um, I did um, the uh, Sopranos rap parties. Um, we did the NBC.com launch party. This was, you know, beginning of all the dot coms. And so um, I was able to, to work on these huge scale events that were, were brilliant. And boy, did that light a fire under me. And I started to see all the possibilities of working uh, with food was, you know, was really opening up for me. Um, and so I continued working in that industry in New York for close to nine years. Um, right before I left, um, I woke up um, one day and realized um, and I was waking up because I had to, had to pay a vendor and I had deliveries. I was director of operations for three restaurants in lower Manhattan at this point. Um, and I didn't want to run restaurants. That was never something I set, uh, set out to do in life. And so um, walked down to the restaurant from, from my <laughs> um, uh, apartment on the Upper West Side thinking, what did I want to do and how did I want to take all this knowledge that I had that I had gained studying wine and food and working for all these phenomenal chefs and, and part of these parties and, and it just dawned on me, well that's what I enjoy doing. And so um, I literally went in, called the owner and quit that day and said, you know what, I'm going to dive head first into what I want to do with life. And um, that has led it to where I am right now. I just, I, I threw it all up in the air and hoped the, the pieces land. And, and my friends said I was absolutely insane for, and I was, for giving up <laughs> the job that I had, the money that I had coming in and living in New York City and just said, you know what, caution to the wind, I'm going to follow my heart and do what I want to. And um, my parents retired out here, and so I moved out here shortly thereafter. There was nothing I was doing in New York that I couldn't do out here. And um, I got a wonderful job working for a small little boutique catering company that had a, a, a small cafe that was sell, serving meals for lunch called the Herb Box. And um, what you don't know, Will, is actually we started as a catering company 22 years ago. Oh, yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, yeah, and so it was out of market demand for our food that we opened up a restaurant. We literally moved the wall back, cut a hole in it, and started serving wraps, sandwiches, and salads out of that hole. So we have been born out of a hole in the wall. You can honestly tell people that. It's really cool. <laughs> Um, and people were sitting out in the parking lots and on the curbs eating these wraps and sandwiches. And so Susan realized that there was a brand here. And so she ran to Target, bought uh, three tables, six chairs, put them in front, and um, that developed into a restaurant. And our, our first um, hot item that we served was our butter, butternut squash enchiladas. Um, in 2008, we opened up a restaurant, and um, the restaurants just started going crazy. And I left the company actually when the recession hit. As many of us, um, uh, we lost our jobs, uh, you know, being top level um, uh, management. And um, they put an offer back on the table for me to come back to the company, uh, buy into the company, um, join it as a partner and uh, president of the catering division. They were going to run with the, the restaurants, and I was going to run with the catering company. And so that's how I came back to the Earth Box. Um, uh, from employee to owner, and uh, we have since developed this catering company into a multi-million dollar brand uh, within three years, and there's no stopping us at That's this awesome. point. And just so for people who aren't from Phoenix, uh, how big are you guys now, just so everyone can get an idea how fast you guys are expanding? Um, so we are looking at three million. Um, right now, when I came back on, we were just under 600,000. Oh wow! And you guys, yeah. and you and you guys have not only the restaurant Scottsdale, the market below it, like the little small yeah. like restaurant. Yeah, we have three restaurants and um, the market, and then of course our catering division. Very cool, very cool. Um, and if you are in Phoenix, you definitely have to make a a stand, stop by at your box. It's, and I think one of the interesting things about your guys' concept is, um, it's not like other. I mean, I, you guys were doing fresh and you know easy food before fresh and easy was like huge, right? So can you talk to you a little bit about what type of food you guys make and kind of the process that you guys kind of put into your catering? Well, I don't know why you're calling me fresh and easy first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we take uh, what we say is tried and true recipes and give them a twist. So while someone might be serving bacon wrapped um, shrimp, we have a prosciutto wrapped shrimp, the black egg glaze, and spicy soy mustard. 
it's it's a, a basic dish that we really make our own, and we give it these these crazy good flavors that um, uh, are are still clean, elegant, um, uh, and pedestrian. Um, something that you're, you will never see, or you haven't seen up to this point in the herb box, is fragua or caviar. Not that we couldn't do it for you or that we wouldn't, but it's just not who we are at the root of, of, of our brand. We want pedestrian, accessible food for the masses with, with a twist. We want to make it interesting. That's awesome. So, like, I think one of my favorite things that I ever had that you made was the, the Gouda mac and cheese when you guys did, like, stations with the Gouda mac and cheese. And, you know, you think, I used to say, you know, Blue Box was the best, and, I, you know, it's hard to beat the Blue Box. But, you know, one day you got to grow up, and Michael had these stations at, I think it was, I forgot, it was like an MPI event or something like that, and you were doing this Gouda mac and cheese stations where you build it on your own and choose what goes in it, and, oh, my God, it was just amazing to die for. Yeah, I <laughs> You know, that's one of those things that never goes out of style in my eyes, and that's mac and cheese. I mean, I don't care how old we get that and a good grilled cheese sandwich, it's never going to go wrong. That's true. That's very true. And I think that's, like, that's a perfect example of what you're saying, though, is, like, you know, it's not necessarily, like, most people are just, like, mac and cheese, hair have it. But you guys said, like, hey, we're going to make a Gouda, we're going to make it really, really good, and we're going to, I think you guys have, like, truffles in it, right? Um, a couple, like, other small things that kind of, like, elevated it. Right, short rib, um, uh, our, our nitrate-free Nyman Rand bacon, um, and there was uh, blue cheese, there was poblano and onion saute, there was wild mushroom saute, there was all kinds of different items that can be thrown in there. Um, there was lobster, there was chicken, there was, yeah, a million, a million things. That's cool. And so, and I'm, I'm, I really apologize to everyone who's tuned in live or watching this at the end of the day right now because you guys are probably starving now, especially those on the East Coast. It's getting the end of the day, and you guys are saying, oh, I tuned into the Rock episode this week. I'm starving now. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, cool, because I know we could probably talk about food forever. You know how much of a foodie I am and how much I love food. Um, so I didn't know that you guys were catering in terms of division. So kind of my question was going to be how did you guys kind of make that transition, but I'm going to instead of kind of flip it, that you know, a lot of uh, you know restaurants out there are saying, you know what? It's really we make the food. We have the kitchen already. It's really easy for us to make big plates of food, you know, and making that transition to catering. Right? You see, just more restaurants opening up a catering arm. Right? So, what's your recommendations or you know thoughts around restaurants who are becoming catering companies? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it hurting you guys? Is it good for you guys? What are your thoughts? You know, there's always going to be enough business in the world for everyone. Um, I think where it really starts to hurt is they under they undercharge, they overcharge. They don't really know how to enter the market properly. Um, that's A. B. Um, they overpromise and start to serve the wrong items. I was recently at an event at a bar uh, where the, the owner um, uh, is a, is a chef and cooks. Um, and had made food for everyone to eat and had capons in a, a chafing dish. Now that sounds out sounds absolutely delicious, right? I mean yeah. who doesn't want a nice capon? You're in a bar. Okay, there's no fork and knife. Capon is not the prettiest thing to eat, so you have to use your fingers. So you, it's like caveman mentality. And and that's just not thinking through what you're going to serve. You're, you're yeah. drinking with your hand and now you have to eat with your hands. You know, um, because kibon is really tactile food. Mm -hmm. um, that's for a uh, fine dining or a, a plate and served meal. That's not for a bar food. You know, you really have to think think it through what you're going to be serving. And um, a lot of people that are entering the market don't really do that. They just totally. want to serve good food, and yeah. that, that's part of it. But there's three other steps before you get to that good food. Awesome. I find too that a lot of the restaurants too they they're used to going you know from kitchen to 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 the to the diner the, the the customer like in five seconds right where like you know catering you have to design okay this might be sitting in a kitchen while the CEO is talking for an extra half an hour and you're sitting like waiting and waiting and waiting versus being you know raw made right there for the person right so I find like the quality is sometimes not as good too. Right, absolutely. It, it's what's going to travel well. You know, we have um, a fried dish that we will uh, serve, and it's a pakora. A pakora is an Indian dish. We serve ours with kale, corn, onion, vegan yellow pepper aioli, sweet and spicy serrano glaze. It's brilliant. It's amazing. But it's because the breading that we put on this that it holds up and that we can serve. We also are known where we started for our wraps and sandwiches, right? Well, those always came with a sweet potato chip that has a little curry sea salt dusting on it. 
those uh, chips, I would say four months out of the year, we can't serve them because it, they, they, they get gummy because of the humidity in the air. And yes, it does get humid here in the desert. Um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a matter of knowing what you're going to serve, how it's going to hold up. Um, we have Korean fried cauliflower that I just, I will not do at a catering event because the breading is just not conducive. It has to just be just right to be fantastic. And, and uh, those are variables that I don't want to throw into place when you already have a million variables working against you when you're offsite catering. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, and then I'm going to flip it because I didn't know that you guys were the catering arm first. You know, if there's a, let's say there's caterers out there watching this right now, what would be your recommendation to them if they want to go and make the flip and go brick and mortar and open up a restaurant? You guys obviously made it super successful now opening up your third restaurant. Uh, I'm sure more are going to come soon, hopefully one right behind my house. Um, and so what are your recommendations to catering companies that want to make the switch into becoming a restaurant? No. Um, <laughs> you know, what costs are so crazy with restaurants. With, with catering, um, you buy exactly, you know what you've sold, so you buy exactly that amount of food, and you sell that amount of food. You don't have a lot of overhead. Um, with restaurants, you don't know who's coming in, when they're coming in, how much they're going to be eating, um, but you still have to have all of that food. So the amount of waste that you can go through um, when, you know, God forbid, uh, I was living in New York City during 9-11, and I was running a, um, uh, we were in Nuevo Latino uh, restaurant on, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you have to imagine all of that food um, that we um, had in our refrigerator, uh, we were taking home to feed our families because A, we didn't know if we were going to get off that island. B, we didn't know, you know, when everything was going to open back up. We did see, we didn't know what was going on. Um, but we weren't going to be serving anything in that restaurant. And so we're talking thousands of dollars in food costs that went home with our employees. Um, wow. and, and stuff like that happens all the time. You can get a crazy storm in that kills your business for three days, but your refrigerator is full and ready to serve people. And, you know, when you start to think about that sort of uh, cost, um, cost issues, it's, it's not a walk in the park. It's not just, I'm going to open my door and people are just going to flock right in. There's mm -hmm. so many other variables, just like um, uh, off-site catering, um, but things that you have to do. You have no choice but to put that money out there you know, and buy that food so you're prepared for those people that may or may not come in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Um, by the way, um, ra totally random question. So uh, Alex actually had this question before the show, um, and I completely forgot to ask it, but I'm um, going to take a 360-degree turn, and I want to ask you, um, if you weren't in catering, what do you think you would be doing? Oh, that's <laughs> me. Wow. Um, I really don't know um, because I was running restaurants and I know how to do that but I don't like to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, based on your advice you're like I don't want to go into restaurants, right? Like because I, I like this is so nice knowing exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah, exactly. I I really would be at a loss of what I would be doing. Probably something in, in show business whether it's managing um, uh, touring companies or something along, along those lines, which I did think about doing for a little while in New York. Um, but everything kept bringing me right back to food and wine. But it would probably be, if I wasn't going to be in the food and wine event industry, it would be going that route and taking my existing knowledge of dance and, and um, uh, performance and going, actually maybe doing something with my original degree. That's awesome. I was going to say, like, I, I think you're definitely, I mean, I knew you were going to be really electric being on the show, but I think this, like, I'm contrasting you with a lot of guests we had. Like, if you're only listening to audio, you have to see Michael. He's, like, your energy, the way you move around, the way you move your arms is very electric. And, like, when you laugh, it's awesome. Like, so, you know, I think that's really, really cool. And I think that just goes to show because you, you came from the show business and you came from dance and you understand how the body interacts with, you know, communication. Uh, I think that's a huge piece of it. So, yeah, if you're not watching, 
watching the video right now, you got to see the most electri electrifying person we've ever had on the show. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm going to um, kind of take a step back. So we obviously have, we have a lot of event planners who might be tuning in who have tons of experience, but then we also have some people who don't have as much experience hiring catering companies. Um, so um, my question to you is, let's say, for example, I'm hosting my first event, mm -hmm. or maybe it's my second event, and I've only been you know randomly hiring catering companies, but I feel like I could do something better, but I don't know what quite to do. I don't know what I'll do when I'm choosing my food. What would you recommend when someone's doing their first event, how to choose what food you're going to do? You know, do you let the catering company decide everything, or are you going to say, no, there's certain things you should definitely avoid? Right. Uh, you know, it just depends on the type of event. It depends on, on who you're serving. It depends on um, the time of day and the client, first and foremost. You know, um, people will say that they want appetizers. They want a heavy hors d'oeuvre. So what does that mean? You know, that, because heavy hors d'oeuvre to some could just mean literally little canopies and, and a few dips and cheese. Um, heavy hors d'oeuvre to others mean basically four complete food or what I call small plates. You know, basically everything that you would have in a dinner but just cut small and so you can have a full meal. Um, and, you know, there, there are others that, of course, there are all the dietary restrictions and, and um, a vegan and, and gluten-free or a vegetarian or no pork or, you know, no GMOs, no this, no that. Um, and so really understanding their needs, their wants, their desires. Um, one of my favorite questions is where do they like to dine out and what do they eat when they're there? Because that's going to really tell you because when they're dining out, they're entertaining. When they're entertaining, that's what they're hiring me to do. And so it's a great way to start, you know, start that ball rolling. And also, you start a little bit of a personal, oh, I've never been there. Oh, I love that place. What do you have there, you know? Um, and, and so you, you really get that ball rolling that way. Um, I Things that I try to stay away from are saucy items. And I'm saying that, you know, I put hummus on almost every every menu. I put <laughs> butter in a squash. <laughs> Because <laughs> I love those items, um, and they're both you know soupy, saucy items. But it's it's a matter of um, then knowing you know our hummus is a very sturdy, thick hummus. It's not a, a runny hummus. Um, the sauce on the enchiladas is, is there's not a ton of it's not swimming in sauce. So it, it's it's knowing your food, understanding your food, understanding what's going on, and then God forbid knowing the surroundings that they're eating it in. You know, um, I've done parties uh, in, in people's homes that everything is this white or light beige. And the last thing you want to do is bring in red wine into that house. You know, it's, <laughs> um, really understanding where you're serving it, um, who's drinking it. Um, you know, because you don't want to leave a mess. You don't want a, a reminder. The only reminder that, you know, your client should have is your card, not the red wine stain on there. So <laughs> if it wasn't yours, um, there was someone else drinking it, you still need to be aware of, you know, um, every guest in that house is your guest. You're hosting that party, including the owner of that house or venue space. Um, I love that you said like the whole the, the what's your favorite restaurant. I feel like that's an amazing survey question to send out to your attendees and say, send it out to you know your thousand attendees and say, what's your favorite restaurant? What do you like to eat when you go out? And boom, like that builds your menu right there, right? Like if you see these commonalities that people are like, burritos, 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 you're like, we got to have burritos, right? Um, exactly. I love that so much. It's really, really insightful. Um, I, I, I thought it was really interesting too that you're mentioning the alcohol portion too. Do you find a lot of caterers um, are, you know, as much as like, you know, the, the I always consider the caterer separate from the, the, the bartender, but do you find that you are in that you should design what the alcohol menu is going to look like and the drink menu is going to look like too, or you know, do you think that's completely separate? So I, I no, I, I came back uh, to the herb box from designing events, and I loved what I was doing with that company. It was Pacific Events. They're out of San Diego. They, were, they had an office here in, in in Scottsdale, and I was I loved what I did. I came back here not only because I love this brand and I wanted to come home, um, but I wanted to design the whole event. And that was not just the look of the all wow when people walked in or the entertainment aspect of it, but when people are eating and drinking because that all goes into the theme and, and, and the entire experience. Um, you can have a great room with mediocre food and it's still going to be a wonderful event. You can, you can have phenomenal food in an ugly room and it's still going to be a good event. You know, but when you have great food, great wine, great drink, great you know design. Um, great. <laughs> 
right? Um, and so I really want to have my hand on everything. I want to do it all. Um, and so we do. We, we, uh, we offer the beverages. We offer phenomenal food. And we will do your entire design. Um, we don't have to. Of course, there are so many other people out there that are doing beautiful design as well. Um, but I, we like to do it all. So if someone um, allows us, um, we will pair their wines, um, design specialty cocktails. Um, uh, I, I, out of the open, we have people that walk around with uh, um, um, coffee and shots of uh, vodka, you know, for private parties um, to wake everybody up for, you know, the, the bird's nest. Um, you know, we, we just like to have fun with it. Absolutely. By the way, I don't think I got or I got the chance to share. Like, can you talk a little bit about some of the? I mean, I didn't even get a chance to mention some of the amazing clients that you've you've gotten to work with. Can you can you name drop some of the cool clients? I mean, I just want people to know, like, the you're not just serving like you're mentioning homes and things like that, but you're not just serving like dinners at people's homes. You're doing like these epic events. So can you just give us an example of maybe your top three clients that you're working with? Um, that I'm allowed to mention. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what the, the gag word is that I, that I have. Um, no, uh, I would say our one of our biggest that we're working on right now is the Open. Um, uh, so it's the Phoenix Open. Uh, the Thunderbirds have a private tent on the 18th hall, and we do the design and menu. Um, every year there's a for, different For those show. who don't know what the Phoenix Open is, can you describe what it is? By like, We're hoping to do an episode just on the Phoenix Open because it's like one of the biggest events in the country that no one wow. knows about. It's impossible to describe this thing. I have gone to PGA, so it's a golf tournament. Um, and I've gone to PGA tournaments all around the country, um, coming from family golfers. Um, and my father always wanted me to golf and offered to buy me a pink golf bag. And I told him that wasn't why I didn't want to golf. I just didn't like <laughs> golfing. <laughs> um, so he, um, uh, the, the, it's a golf tournament. And when you go to golf tournaments traditionally, um, you pick your, your favorite golfers and you walk quietly along this course and watch them golf. And there might be a couple parties in uh, a clubhouse afterwards or, you know, in surrounding cafes. Um, for the Phoenix Open, they, they have huge uh, trouble, triple um, layer, uh, triple floor tents, um, uh, grandstands. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of people a day there. Um, and, you know, coming up to a million plus um, by the end of the Open, um, watching this huge golf um, game going on. And honestly, I forget that there's a, they're golfing. <laughs> um, because in our tent, it is not um, out of the ordinary for us to have a DJ, um, for us to have live entertainment, um, for us to be passing hors d'oeuvres and, and, you know, three buffets. And um, I think this past year, um, I can't even remember the theme, uh, but this coming year it's a hunting lodge, um, and so we have taxidermy on the walls, we have um, uh, antler chandeliers, and, and when you walk in it's not going to feel like you're at a, at a golf outing at all. Um, we're bringing in sushi chefs, we're bringing in this, we're bringing in that, um, and really making it an, an entire experience um, that feels like someone's going to a high-end hunting lodge. And Same. oh yeah, if you look to the you know east or I'm sorry, if you look to the west, you're gonna see a, a, a green. There's some you know there's Tiger Woods and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I don't That's know if awesome. Tiger Woods is that, but yeah, and, it's and really you've cool. To work with some great sporting clients too, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, you're yeah. Allowed, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to talk about. So I'm just like yeah, being yeah, vague. Yeah. yeah, we we play with the we play with some baseball teams in town that are from the west coast, uh, but I'm not gonna tell you who. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some really big ones. We're very fortunate. <laughs> We're very fortunate to, to have worked with them. I think one of my favorite clients um, was getting a call to cater a photo shoot. Um, and this is my first time that I was uh, with the Earth Box. So it was 2007. And uh, it was a smaller order. It was only like 20-some um, lunch boxes. And, and I walk in, and I walk into the garage where uh, there are people, and a woman turns around and says, oh, is that lunch? And I just stood there starstruck because it was Annie Leibovitz, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and nothing good or polite or correct is going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> He's like, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm sure that's all that came out of my mouth. <laughs> I was lacking all tact. I wasn't prepared for that. Um, and come to find out she had uh, Barack Obama, um, uh, Oprah Winfrey, and um, uh, Muhammad Ali inside. And that that was the day that she shot those three together. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, really cool stuff. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, Pink um, uh, has been in the restaurants and at events. There's many people that have come through that we've had the wonderful opportunity to work with. Um, and, you know, whether you have a big name or whether, you know, your house is next to mine and, and I happen to be catering in it, um, you're going to get the same experience no matter what. Because we just, one of our big things is passion lives here. We really enjoy what we do. Um, this is my happy place, this little room right here. And so um, <laughs> when, I'm not, when I'm at home and I have things to do, I won't bring my computer home. I, I like to come into my office and work um, and, and create and design and, and talk to people because I'm in a job. Uh, my job is, is setting stage for, for people to make lifelong memories. And when you look at it like that and you think about it like that, you realize the what you're doing is pretty big. It's not frivolous at all. It's not, you know, I just host parties. Um, I do host parties. I host some of the best parties in the city as far as I'm concerned. And so I have the opportunity to go to these parties all the time. And I love what I do because of that. Cool. Very cool. Um, and it definitely, I mean, again, it shows with your your excitement and your energy that you have around everything. So, um, awesome. Well, we're about the halfway mark, so I just want to remind everyone who's tuned in, either offline or if you're tuned in live, it was mainly for you guys, to ask questions at, throughout the entire show. If you're watching the GoToWebinar right now, uh, all you have to do is hop on and go in the question pane. It's over on the right-hand side. Just click questions. You can submit your questions, and Michael uh, is happy to answer any of them about anything catering-related. This is your chance to pick his mind. Um, or if you're not feeling like using GoToWebinar, hop on your favorite social network and Alex's favorite social network ever, Twitter, uh, and tweet. And Alex is tweeting live during the entire show, uh, answering your guys' questions as well. And we'll actually answer some of them online and he'll shoot them on over to me to ask Michael as well. So hop on Twitter, hashtag event icons, or on the GoToWebinar and happy to answer them. So, all right, I'm going to steer around and want to start talking a little bit about like bigger things going on with the catering industry. Obviously, you know, I'm big into AV, so I don't know really what's going on with food and everything like that, but I think everyone's really curious to know what are the big trends going on in the catering industry right now, whether it's a type of food or a way of business, uh, everything like that. What do you think are your biggest trends that you saw, I guess, from the past year, and then where do you see as the biggest trends moving into this next year? So we know currently the big trend are stations. Um, uh, when you go to the, the trendy um, weddings, it's a cocktail, um, you know, four or five hours, which is my favorite type of cocktail. Um, and there's different stations around the room. Um, there might be action stations. There's different uh, geographical, you know, references with these stations or foods. Um, and that's that's a lot of fun. I think we're going to see a huge, huge complete 180 on that and turn it back around to plated experiences. And it's really going to be about the whole culinary experience. Um, People are really starting to to think about where their food comes from, and and um, how their how their food is grown, how their food got to their plate, which is not something that that have has really been on on people's minds um, previously. Now, about 20 years ago, you started to see on menus um, the the farms. You know, the the Nyman Ranch pork came in the um, blue sky kale that came with la 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 la. You know, and and that's starting to trickle down now into catering. And so um, uh, tonight, actually, uh, right after I leave this, um, uh, I'm going to um, an event that we're calling uh, Chef Alex Strada Experience, um, who's our new culinary director, um, uh, James Beard Award, uh, a two-star Michelin chef. And um, we are doing a plated dinner for 18 people, um, uh, three hand pass and uh, four courses. Um, and they're going to sit there and watch the chef prepare all of this food. And, and it's, it's a huge experience. And that's what people want to see. We're serving venison and sea bass um, as the entrees. And it's something really special. It's not your double entree with a you know green salad and uh, a slice of pie at the end. This is um, a restaurant experience. This is a culinary experience. And where less is more, I would say, um, that's going to be the biggest trend. It's not about having 25 stations. It's going to be about having four courses and some phenomenal food. Awesome. 
That, that's really good. No, I mean, I, I, I found that I think at every single place, we everything's been like, yeah, stations primarily. Like, right. I don't remember the last place at dinner actually got at an event. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I mean, at the Zonies Awards, probably when you did it was the yeah. last time that we did. A, I did a play to dinner, other than like going to a restaurant, obviously. Um, very, very cool. Okay. Um, do you see like there and being any cool new foods that are being discovered too, like that no one's you know utilizing? Like for example, like kale. It came out of like nowhere, like what three, four years ago. I feel like I'm getting it. It probably was even further down. I was obviously a laggard on that end. But is there like a piece of food that's becoming really hot that like you gotta have this thing, you know, uh, like buttered squash enchiladas or something like that. Yeah, you know what, I, I think that we're going to, again, go back to basics. Um, we've been all into this superfood thing, right? Um, uh, everything's a superfood right now. Um, whether it's blueberries, quinoa, or kale, or whatever the, you know, the latest superfood is. Um, but I think that the rise of heirloom items and, and back, to, back to our basics, it's going to be great food, like I said. Um, just simple fresh ingredients. Um, we don't want the the tomatoes that look like a perfect little tomato. We want a gorgeous tomato that tastes like a tomato with just a little salt and pepper. You know, and, and it's that 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 wow moment of I, I, I know what I'm eating, not just shoving this, you know, stuff in my mouth. Because let's face it, tomatoes kind of gelatinous and weird. Um, you know, but and, and there's not, you know, with the tomatoes that you buy in most grocery stores, not a lot of flavor. Um, so it's it's actually tasting a tomato that tastes like like earth and that sweetness and 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 tastes like a, a bright summer's day. Um, and and having that um, with maybe some fresh um, arugula with spice and salt and pepper. I mean, just so light, so so special. Four or five ingredients, not the minestrone effect, where there's 25 things on your plate. It's it's simple and fresh and and unique, and less is more. And that really, I really honestly believe that that is the direction of our food. I know that's the direction that we're going as a company, um, and I'm starting to see it more and more as I dine out. Um, you don't see these menus that are, um, you know, these 35-page Bibles anymore. You're starting to see, um, you know, when you go to a fine dining restaurant, there's seven entrees. Seven. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. That's that's this this chef is feeling very confident about these seven dishes. <laughs> you know, I mean, who am I to say no? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, well, and, I'm hoping for one that pretzels are going to make a comeback, and we start seeing more pretzels at events because you know how much I love pretzels. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how how often did you see the pretzel with the cheese fondue? I mean, that oh, was, was like everywhere. Gasping. Right, exactly. And I'll be honest, we served it a couple times as well. You know, at different events. Um, so that gastro pub thing was really hot. You know, I, uh, I, you know, pizza was was hot, and pizza will always be hot. In my book. Don't, don't ever, yeah, I will always love pizza. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not knocking my pizza, um, but I, I really think that that we're going to see a return to um, the etiquette of the dining table and fine dining. No more of the the loud rock and roll fine dining. It's going to be uh, an experience. You know. Um, get ready to put coal up your butt and make some diamonds and, and pinch it up tight and really get it going uh, and have some fun with us. Uh, a real uptight, fun dining. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you mentioned something that I wanted to ask a lot of questions about because, you know, now we're in a day and age where you can't just have like one menu, right? Where now because of all the allergies and restrictions that people have, whether, like you said, gluten-free, vegetarian. It used to be vegetarian and meat was like the two options, good. right? But now there's like... 50 million ones. So what are your tips of planners with coping with these? Because I know it's a, like you can't individually cook a meal for every single person, right? So what, what are your thoughts and tips? Is there one that you should totally make sure that you have and one that's, you know, that you like should say like, hey, don't worry about this. This is like 1% of people or, you know, make sure you budget for this. Give us your tips when it comes to these restrictions and everything so like that. So I should always be prepared. Um, you know, as, as a caterer, when we're hosting events, um, these people, like I said before, are guests. And whether it's our home or our venue or not, they are guests at our party. And so if the client didn't ask for a vegan, a vegetarian, lactose-free, just be prepared to be able to serve it. Uh, I think it's so important. Um, I'm not vegan or vegetarian at all, and I will sit at a table and realize everything that I've ordered for these seven clients is all vegetarian. Um, we, we love our herbs and our vegetables at our restaurant, so we serve a lot of it. Um, 
But, you know, they don't have to just be grilled vegetables. It doesn't have to be a plate of, you know, dry quinoa with, you know, some, some strange thing thrown on top. Like, uh, vegetables can be interesting. So, so let them sing, let them dance, let them, you know, let them perform on their own um, and uh, in, enjoy what you're serving. But I would say stop worrying about them and just be able to accommodate them. Awesome. I, I love that, that you, they should always be prepared. And to me, that's a great interview question if you're selecting a vendor to say, hey, so I know obviously everyone's prepared to create everything, but what happens if none of our people mark themselves as the, you know, the vegan or something like that and someone shows up, are you going to be prepared for the one-off chance? And tell me about like your backup plan with that. Like almost as important as saying, does the AV company have backup equipment? Do you have backup catering solutions for these restrictions? Absolutely, absolutely, and you know we'll we'll serve vegetarian that has a a goat cheese crema, um, but on that plate, I guarantee you there'll be three that don't have crema on them, just in case there's someone with a lactose free need, and that person that's hand passing will point that out to people. Awesome, so awesome, it's, I love it. it's being prepared like that, and 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 being able to service everyone who who wants to eat. Awesome. I love it. So uh, we actually have a question from the audience. Karen, one of our awesome viewers who tunes in every single week. Shout out to you, Karen. So excited to have you back here. Uh, so she asked, have you ever had an event where food is a central part of the event? So for example, social eating, where it was the event was purely about the food, right? Uh, stops where you know the food was a part of the break was the break from the event was to actually eat. Um, what do you, like have you had events like that? Any cool sharing tips when it comes to the focus on uh, eating for an event? Absolutely, tonight's event. I mean, that, that they're getting together to have a culinary experience. That that is the whole reason that that they are um, um, gathering. And so you know, making it a wow moment for them is is of the utmost. You know um, importance um, and and doing something that they're going to remember. Um, we're actually going a little out of our vein because we're highlighting the chef um, that will be cooking tonight, um, and so we're doing things like tuna tartare and a green apple um, with a gremolata. Um, there is uh, a chef is doing this phenomenal hot apricot wrapped around a prosciutto um, skewered with a piece of rosemary. What? <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. And so when you pull it off, you'll get pieces of the rosemary. Um, you don't actually eat the stick of the the of, um, the stick of the rosemary, but just the leaves of it with the hot apricot and prosciutto. It's brilliant. It's it's going to be so good. But people will remember those. That's what people are going to really remember. I honestly, um, a huge believer that a hand pass um, should be a single bite. Um, and as my as I like to tell my ladies, it doesn't assault the lipstick. Um, so it's just simple, eat, and huge flavor of food. And so when you're when you're doing something that is um, only based purely for eating, make it a wow moment for them. Don't give them sliders. Don't give them you know something that's going to be forgettable. Make sure it is. I mean, if you do sliders, make sure they're going to be the best dang sliders they ever had. You know, um, uh, but. Do something that's going to be memorable for them, and they're going to walk away talking about, um, as we say, long past their last bite, talking about that food. Love it. I love it. I love the like, yeah, trying to create memories out of everything that you're doing, the little small memories that they're going to remember. Um, so um, I'm curious because there's probably doing catering for so long now and being in the restaurant industry, there's probably a lot of things that you know about like huge challenges that are like every day happen to you and you just like you know the clients you you're like man i wish if if susie had known how much we went through to make this event happen right what's the hardest part about catering that you wish all of your clients knew about wow um you know i i don't think that i would want them to know about all the hard work that we go through i, I don't because um I think that it would make them feel um, feel bad, and I want them to think that I just walk in and and flip my wrists and boom, it's done. Um, and it's so simple and easy. I don't want them to um, experience the 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 sweat, the tears, sometimes the tears. Lord knows the tears. Um, the the hard work, the running around, the um, oh my gosh, I forgot this sauce. You know, okay, what time is it? Okay, I can make it back, or oh, we have to go to the grocery store and whip one up. Um, whatever the case may be, they don't need to ever see any of that. And so, what I want my my clients to know is the effort, effortlessness, 
that it took us to produce their party for them so they can sit back and become a guest at their own home. Cool. I would never want them to know the hard work that we go through. Very cool. I love that. Uh, yeah, be a guest at your own home. That's awesome. Or All your right. own or your own yeah, whatever. Exactly. You should be relaxing, home. especially if it's going to be so good food. I want to eat it. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Just you know, relax. I, I, I'm such a sweaty Betty, um, and so I have to, you know, really. I want us all to hurry and get done, and so I am a happy man. And we're set up an hour before guests even arrive. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, we're all set up a half hour before guests arrive, or an hour before guests arrive, so I can sit and relax. So when they arrive. I'm just effortlessly walking through the room like nothing ever happened, and there's all this stuff going on. I'm hoping to have this going on, you know. I love it. I love it. I would say I'm the same way too. I want to have like yeah, the AV all set up, so then that way they walk in and like, whoa, this is an amazing stage. I'm like, yeah, if you had known how many hours we just put into building this thing, um, you know, for 48 hours, you know, there's no need for them to know that. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I know you've d got, done some really cool things. I'm going to steal one of them and share them. So we did for uh, our ILEA chapter, had our annual Zonies Awards, like our Arizona Events Industry Award, and you catered it. And you did probably one of the coolest ways of serving uh, salad dressing ever. You put it in a, a – it it's called a – God, I'm calling it a beaker. Atomizer. but I'm, What was it called? Atomizer. Atomizer. Is that, is that, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So you put it in an atomizer and had a spray ball to serve it with it. And no, everyone's like, wow, this is like the talk of the party was how you put like dressing on a salad, which is amazing. So I know you've got so many cool ideas and things you've seen across events. So I want to know what's the coolest way you've ever seen food served? Sorry for stealing. Wow. Um, I think that would have to go to um, JW Marriott Desert Ridge. Um, I was designing events there, like I said, for a few years with Pep, and um, I don't know what food was actually on the station, but they had a full-on beehive um, covered on one side with um, lucite, and these bees were in the little um, in the little hive hole things. Uh, um, honeycombs. Yeah, honeycombs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and. They were working their little butts off, and I, you know, actually, I think there was like honey granola and granola bars and things like that um, on on the table. I was so blown away that the thought that went into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, and they, they well, had a honey wrangler and the build the like yeah the lucite the container for them. Right, right, and then to get them in there and and to think that. I mean, I, it's, it's stuff like that that I put up on a pedestal, and I'm like, okay, if I could only do that, if I can, if I can think that way, and and it's just always trying to think, how can I serve this outside of a bowl? How can I serve this around what would make it interesting? You know, because it was just granola. I, I'm almost positive now that's what it was. Um, but boy, they had live bees producing honey on that table. How freaking cool is that? Yeah, you know, cool. so so it's it's um, I think just thinking out of the box and how you're going to serve something, and you you'll hear me say that all the time. Think out, outside of the box, and I I don't even I forget that my the company is uh, you know the herb box, but uh, <laughs> but it's you know I really want people to have that full experience. It's not just eating good food, like I said. You know, um, if you're gonna have to preset a salad, as most caterers will tell you. Um, that is a very difficult thing to do because the salad starts to break down within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you dress the salad, you know, 20 minutes later, it's kind of not good anymore. You know, I mean, is it edible? Yeah, sure. But it's not special. And yeah. so we put that dressing in an atomizer and suddenly, wow, that salad can sit there all day. And it's, you know, the, the guests get to control how much dressing is on their, their their plate and you know it's a whole experience and you know that they're, they're part of the whole you know making their salad now because that was a, a roasted pear salad and so we had the pear sliced and cheese in between and so they had to mix it all up and cut it all up and and it suddenly became a moment and that was just a salad and so it's it's it's, it's really cool to just really push yourself and um, I want to say each one of those atomizers might have been eight cents Eight cents to make that wow moment for a salad. Amazing. It's worth it. Yeah, Definitely. exactly. Money. <laughs> awesome. So speaking of moments, 
Um, this is a great question we actually got from Alex. Again, Alex has got, and as the, the Twitter master who's live tweeting this during this entire show, um, he would, of course, come out with a great social media question. So a lot of, like, we're in the day and age where what's the first thing people do when they get their food? It's not to, like, oh, I'm not it or anything. They bust out their phones and they take a picture of it, right? Instagramming their food, right? Gosh, Instagram turned it into such a thing. Um, and, you know, how much of your time is put into making the food look pretty and versus making it taste good, right? Um, so let's start with that question. And then I guess what, uh, uh, you know, is this even something that people should have to worry about? Or is it just something that you guys were doing beforehand and then now people are taking a picture of it? No, you know what? Um, I think beforehand we were really into um, keeping it simple and clean. And, and so it was, you know, yes, we're going to have this homemade hummus on a table, but it's just going to be hummus in a bowl. Um, and, and that's what it was. Um, and now we're piping hummus into little palm bowls and, and putting the pita, you know, on the palm bowl. Um, it's people eat with their eyes first. Um, and so every chef will tell you that works in a restaurant. It's all about how you plate up the food. You can plate up something, you know, um, you know, Without, without a lot of thought, and people aren't going to remember it, you place something up, um, the same tasting food, and stack it all, and put this and that, and, and paint this on it, and throw that around it, and and suddenly they are thinking that it's the best meal they ever had, and it's the <laughs> food over here. Um, but it's how you present it that just wows everybody. And so um, it really is, presentation is, is everything. It's all about the details. We're in the, we're in the business of details. Um, everyone in town has great food. There's not a single caterer out there that doesn't have something they're serving that is not phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only thing that's going to set us apart beyond service is the details. Absolutely. And, and how we present our food is one of those details. And so just I all I, that way. A great example, I think, of that too is your neighbor, the people right across the street from you, Cowboy Chow. They have this original chop salad, which is now famous as its own Facebook page, right? And it's literally all it is is a chop salad. Everyone's had this before, but the way they did it, where I mean, the ingredients are really this is a really delicious salad, but the way they did it with it, like they put it in layers and stripes, and then they're like, "Do you want me to mix it now?" And you're like. Oh, I just want to keep looking at it, but yes, I please mix it together. And then, and then they chop it and mix it up, and you're like, oh, this is amazing. I think that just that visual view of the layers is adds a huge amount to the experience and why people love it so much, probably. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's completely true. Awesome. And by the way, shout out to Cow Cowboy Chow. Uh, after you go to Herb Box, go to Cowboy Chow and get that uh, that original chopped salad. Yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Awesome. So we only got a couple more minutes left. So I want to end the show on the two questions that I end every show on. So first, sticking it up with what is your number one tip that you have for event planners? It can be catering related or not. What's your one tip for event planners to make their lives easier and planning process easier today? Um, wow. Um, smile, um, breathe, um, uh, which things that I have to remember, um, to do myself. Um, I get a little excited if you haven't, uh, can't tell. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, take a moment to, to step away and look at it with fresh eyes. Um, when you get into the, into the, um, uh, into the, the, the trenches and in, you're going really strong and there's these problems and these problems and you're looking at your list and the, oh my gosh, how am I going to solve everything? You know, um, just walking outside, taking two minutes and then coming back in and suddenly it's just all boom, 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 boom. Okay, great. <laughs> and, and it's done. And literally just taking that moment to, to breathe and solve everything. Um, and, you know, because Everyone around you, your staff, your 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 chefs, um, and especially your clients, know when you are starting to sweat. And so, don't ever let them see you sweat, um, uh, both figuratively and and literally. Um, uh, you know, so take those moments. Take those moments. Awesome, awesome. I love it. I love it. 
Uh, by the way, uh, uh, I'm starting to get messages from people saying that we need to stop talking about food because they're all so hungry. So I appreciate that. I think we gave people a break moving from food to breathing. So everyone take a deep breath. We're almost to the end of the show. Then you can go enjoy some herb box. Um, <laughs> all right. So last question that I have for you is uh, what cool resources do you have to share with everyone? Else? You know, a favorite book you just read, a blog, a podcast, a cool tool that you use, um, anything like that. So for example, uh, I just got my new MacBook Pro in, uh, super duper cool, um, however, uh, while it's a cool resource and tool, don't recommend people buying it because I don't even use a touch bar yet, so if you're considering buying a new MacBook, maybe you need to wait. Um, so that's my cool new resource and tool that I'm using. Uh, also just got the new Google Pixel, which I'm loving, you guys all know I'm a tech guy, so uh, go get, check out the Google Pixel phone. But you guys aren't here to hear about my cool resources in tech. <laughs> Um, Mike, Michael, share with us what your favorite resources are, what, what gets you learning, what gets you working well. So I would say um, I get excited by, by creativity and inspiration. And so I can find inspiration walking down the street. Um, I, especially going to a museum, um, I belong to um, Arizona Costume Institute, and uh, that is a, a fashion um, um, uh, section of the Phoenix Art Museum and going and looking at those fabrics um, really excites me and puts ideas for um, how to how to design tables and and um, uh, tablescapes and um, events in my head. Um, I think reading Vanity Fair, um, Vogue, New York Times, the, the food section um, to really stay on top of things outside of your city um, because uh, so often we get stuck in what our city is doing and right and stuck in a little bubble and you have to get outside of the bubble and if you, you if I'm not traveling on a daily basis or a weekly basis um, boy is it so much easier just to read 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 um, those magazines all that print that it's still re relevant for me um, and so I you know I read those articles I look at those pictures and I rip things out um, I have a little inspiration box that I'll go back and, and, and look through when I need to find something. That was David Merrill's idea, so thank you, David, if you're watching. Um, and and I, um, I really try to stay relevant um, and, and ahead of the ball game. I once read a, a, a quote that says, if you see the bandwagon, it's too late. And so um, if you see a trend, how is that trend going to evolve? And that's where you want to be. Awesome. Um, and... Just, do you have like a certain way that you read like when you're looking at magazines are you like using like a Kindle or are you literally just buying the actual physical ma magazines like or is there like a place you go are you going online? Both. I do both. Yeah. Some, some uh, come right to my iPad. Um, some I just like to sit back and before I turn on the TV um, you know or anybody my, my partner wakes up in the house and I'll just you know peruse through the magazines and as the sun is rising and drink my espresso and, and I'm a happy happy man. Um, by myself, yeah, you know, it's it's those moments alone because I, this is a work for me, so I'm not ever turned off. I'm just always, you know, looking for the next greatest thing. Yeah, I mean, like you're kind of always on, right? Absolutely, I really am always on. <laughs> I, I love the idea of the inspiration box, by the way. I haven't heard it in that uh, standpoint. I'm like completely blanking on a famous author's name uh, who's written a ton of famous horror movie books and things like that. that I think I'm, for whatever reason, I can only think of R.L. Stein, and I know it's not R.L. Stein. But anyways, he had always had the idea whenever he'd come up with a book idea, he would just write down a piece of paper and shove it into his drawer next to his bed or his desk or whatever. And then whenever he was ready to write his next book, go in, pick it out, and be like, oh, yeah, cool. And then he would start working on that. I'm just constantly dumping them into it. So like having a good notebook um, and the inspiration box, I think, is just awesome. So you can always just, you know, right now might not that might not mean much, but you can come back to it later, which I really love, for, especially for a busy person like you, you and me, to be able to go back to that. So that's Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. Because you see something and you know you want to eventually do it, but you, you don't have anything to do it on now, you just put it in the box. I love it. Put it in the box, and then when you need an idea, you just start, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I could have done that. I could have done that. It's, it's great. Absolutely great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, time has run out, so I am just so honored. This was such an amazing conversation. I, was so, I learned a ton. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, uh, and huge thank you from uh, the audience. I know they are just applauding at home. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show today and telling, sharing with us your knowledge and uh, all your years of experience. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun.
Awesome. Well, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. So uh, we'll catch you guys next week on hashtag event icons. Uh, and thank you, a huge thank you to all the audience and the people tuned in live. Uh, we'll see you guys all next week. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the Twitter conversation sponsored by Alex Plaxon and Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on Hashtag Event Icons.